My name's Steve Allen. I live down in Newman, Illinois. Uh, and I was in the Marine Corps uh, for three years, uh, from 1968 to 1971. I'm 68 years old, and uh, my first year in the service, I was out at Quantico, Virginia, uh, in the officer training program out there, first the officer candidate school, and then after that uh, at the, the basic school, which uh, is in the same area as the FBI Academy, some does this, some of its training. Um, where I learned to be an infantry officer, and that's the uh, occupational specialty within the military that I had chosen. After my year in Quantico, um, I then went to Vietnam, where I was a platoon commander uh, for several months, and uh, the last part of my tour, I went to Da Nang, which was a far more secure area, and was in the rear, and worked with another guy uh, commanding two uh, grunt platoons or two infantry platoons there and an MP platoon where we did uh, border security for the Mar first marine aircraft wing. After my year in Vietnam I went back to Camp Pendleton and once again served with an, an infantry battalion there first as a headquarters company executive officer and then worked with the S3 office after that. I got out of the Marine Corps in November of 1971. Um, so just to start off with, could you just describe um, who you were and what you were all about uh, before you left for Vietnam and before you enlisted in the, in the Marines, um, and then you, yourself after Vietnam and kind of how, that, how the progression occurred? Um, how, do you think those two people were different at all? If they were, uh, could you describe that? Sure. I grew up on a small farm as uh, half the kids in my small high school did. Back in those days, the farms were a lot smaller. They were truly family farms. Uh, did all the typical things of a farm at that time. We had milk cattle, we had hogs, chickens. Uh, raised most of our own food for our family. Uh, went to a small high school, played football, basketball there. Um, and ran the woods and the creek with my cousins. Did a lot of camping, a lot of hunting. Uh, very much an outdoor person at that time and, and still am to a great extent. Um, after high school, I was 17 when I graduated and I wanted to join the Marine Corps at that time. Uh, my folks didn't think it was a great idea and said, uh, why don't you try college instead um, and then see what you think. So uh, I went to Eastern, uh, graduated from there in 1968 and then immediately went to the Marine Corps and signed up at that time. Um, had a great time at Eastern, um, you know, a great college. I was in every curricular, co-curricular activity I could, could get in from uh, radio, as a matter of fact, and, and uh, performing arts to music. I was always in, uh, in music there. Did a lot of intramural sports, was in uh, student government. A matter of fact, I was a student senator when Jim Edgar was the president of the Senate at that time, and uh, really a class act. He, he, he was far beyond most of us in terms of his maturity, even at that time. Um, then I went to the service. Uh, as far as contrasting who I was when I went to the service, who I came back as, um, came back um, from the service certainly uh, with a little more edge to you know to how I felt about life. Fortunately, I think for me, uh, I was pretty much the same person because I came back to a nurturing environment. I was already married, had a child, had very supportive family, uh, mother, father, brothers, sisters, cousins, aunts and uncles, you know, uh, very, really tight knit family. And uh, also a church family that was very supportive. And, uh, you know, I think my basic faith uh, made a lot of difference in the fact that uh, the Vietnam experience really didn't, did not upend me that bad. Certainly, I did a lot of grieving for the people I lost. Uh, to this day, those people are dear to me. Um, but in terms of my, my core personality, um, I don't think it changed that much, but I certainly uh, matured in some ways, especially in, in terms of being able to take a task um, and take command of the task 
be responsible for it and follow through and, and see it to its conclusion. I think that's probably one of the best things that the Marine Corps did for me. Okay. Um, and you referenced the fact that, you know, before you left for the military uh, or for Vietnam, you were already married and had a child. Could you describe what it's like to come back from war and have, you know, a small child? When I left for Vietnam, my wife and I got married just as soon as I graduated. And then we had a, the baby uh, about five months before I left. So I had already had enough time with this little guy to just really bond. And uh, it's so hard to leave your wife, your other family and friends, and the life that you know behind to go away for a year. But I think the toughest thing for me was to go away and, and, uh, and leave that little guy. The next time I saw him, uh, he was about nine months old, and I met my wife on R&R uh, &R in Hawaii, and was very fortunate in that my son, you know, at, at you know at, at that age of nine months, took his first step uh, while I was with him, and so that was uh, that was a real treat. Of course, after I came back after the full year uh, in the fall of 1970. He didn't know me from Adam, but it didn't take long to pick right back up where we were. The unfortunate downside of that is that my wife uh, lived with her parents during the year I was in Vietnam, and they became so attached to that little boy that it just about broke their hearts when we moved out to California and took their baby you know, away from them. Uh, certainly something I understand. Okay. Um, and I know you referenced this a little bit and the fact that you came from a Christian household and um, could you speak to a little bit about what faith meant to you when you were in Vietnam? Thank you for asking that question. My, my faith was critical not only to my survival, but I, I feel strongly to the survival of my men. Uh, I have a platoon picture of, of my guys. Of course, you know, guys were in and out all the time. There were guys getting wounded. Uh, there were guys with malaria, dysentery, people going on R&R, &R, rotating back home. So you never had your full contingent with you. We were supposed to have between 40 and 50 people with us at all times and rarely have more than a couple of dozen. Um, but in that time that I was actually the platoon commander, I had men very badly wounded, but never had one killed. Uh, by the time I left Vietnam, at least seven of those that I know of uh, were killed in action. Um, and you know, of course, I prayed and prayed strongly every night, every day. As you go out on patrol, I mean, you're, you're afraid. You're afraid every night, and if you're in a situation where there's been a lot of action, uh, you walk around like wondering if you got a target on your back or in the middle of your forehead. Um, and my faith kept me steady. Um, and my relationship with Christ became far more real. Um, you know, it's, it's said in the Bible that uh, God is a spirit, and those that worship him must worship it in spirit and in truth. Well, I finally figured out what that means. He's, uh, he's not Santa Claus that comes around and hands you a miracle here or there as you ask for them. But his presence is there, and if you, if you have the right kind of faith, then uh, he, he takes care of things. And that kind of faith was ceded to me by my parents. Um, you know, and, and typical Sunday school learning and things of that nature. But it matured greatly and took on a, an entirely different form uh, when I started living it. And I think that's one of the things that helped me make good moral decisions as a platoon commander. Uh, certainly there were some, some terrible things that happened in Vietnam. And, uh, you know, some of our people made bad choices uh, and became even war criminals. But I'm, I'm here to tell you that's a rare thing in, in my experience. For the most part, my men were very compassionate. Uh, the American GI, the American Marine, tends to love kids. Uh, they're good guys that tend to hate bullies. Uh, we saw some of the devastating things that the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese did to people over there, and it, it was, it was heartrending. Um, for the most part, like I say, our guys were, were very good to the people, at least when we were out in the field. 
Um, my corpsmen were always ready to take care of the indigenous people, you know, uh, giving them medicine, treating wounds, uh, ear infections. I, you know, just, it's a litany of things that they did. Uh, we carried around uh, sea rations. That's what we ate, plus the rice that we captured at different places. And, uh, you know, like I say, that, that was our diet. Uh, if you didn't have it on your back, you weren't going to eat that day. Um, despite that, we would go into places uh, way out in the in areas that were called free fire zones that anybody out there was supposed to be the enemy. Well, there were people who had not vacated, and it was very obvious that they were not combatants, and my guys would share their rations with them, uh, knowing that they might go hungry for a, for a day or two. Uh, that was not an uncommon occurrence. Um, and so I think, you know, my own morality, personal morality, not that it's certainly not perfect, don't get me wrong, but what was good in me, I, I think that uh, my Christian faith was at the center of that, and I saw that reflected in a lot of my other troops. Uh, and I, th I think that's a real strength. Okay. Um... So kind of going off of, you know, your, your men's interactions with the locals, um, did you ever encounter, you know, as the leader of men, um, any fear from the local Vietnamese people uh, when you guys encountered them? Yes. Uh, the Vietnamese people had every right to be fearful of the Americans, of the South Vietnamese forces, of the Korean Marines, of the NVA, and of the VC, because whenever battle was engaged, if shots rang out, if an explosion went off, um, the bullets started flying and they could be pretty indiscriminate. Um, now the people that I was around for the most part out in the bush didn't have much fear of us. If they saw us coming on patrol, uh, typically there didn't seem to be much fear. As a matter of fact, the kids from those vills would come out begging for candy or cigarettes or whatever they could get. And I'm talking about five-year and six-year-old beg begging for cigarettes. Um, so I, I didn't see a whole lot of that myself. I'm, I have no doubt that it happened uh, in different places in Vietnam, perhaps where the American troops had, had a different attitude. Um, but I do know that, uh, I'll give you an example of, of one of the things that happened. One time we were patrolling through, and I think it was Antenna Valley, but it was way, way out there where the bad guys are. And this young girl came down from out of the, out of the hills there, running toward our platoon. So, and it was, it was rainy and cold, you know, you don't think of Vietnam as cold, but it could be. And uh, she ran to us, and it, it was a girl that they had come through her village the MVA had and took some of their people and she was being used as a porter and pretty much I think as a sex slave as well. So we took her into our platoon and whenever we could get a medevac chopper in then then we flew her out to safety. Um, I don't think we hear a whole lot about the atrocities that the North did. I think it's good that whatever atrocities the Americans were involved in and responsible for, it is very good that they be examined and that the people be punished harshly for those kinds of criminal acts. However, I can tell you this, in my experience, uh, what we did paled in comparison to what the North Vietnamese Army did and to what the Viet Cong did to those people. Did I answer your question? I'm not sure. Yeah, no, that was great. Okay. Thank you. Um, so kind of bringing it back a little bit, um, Going back to, you know, when you decided to enlist in the military, it was, you know, you said that it was something that you wanted to do when you were 17 years old, but you delayed it a few years. Um, so why did you have such a desire to join? You know what? <clears throat> and that changed a lot. That's, I'm glad you asked that question. By the time I was 17 and by the time I was 21 when I actually went in, uh, matter of fact, it just had just turned 22. Of course, in 1964, when I graduated from high school, Vietnam, Vietnam was a blip you know, on the screen. By 1968, when I went in, you know, we'd been through Tet, uh, major battles, 
Um, thousands of lives lost by that time, all of the politics swirling on both sides, and anybody that went into that without reservations was not a thinking person. When I was 17, I was gung-ho. I was a child of a World War II father. Uh, there were five boys in my father's family, and four of them were in the service during World War II. Um, we played, you know, good guys uh, against the bad guys all the time I was growing up because uh, there was World War II, then there was the Korean War. So in my developmental years, you know, uh, being a soldier, being a sailor, an airman or a Marine, you know, that was, that was something that, that guys wanted to do, you know, to protect the country as part of the patriotism and loyalty to what, what America stood for. I carried that with me through the 60s, you know, and continue to be a patriot. That doesn't mean I didn't question whether what we were doing was right or wrong. Uh, I just finished a book by a friend of mine, uh, just, just finished reading it yesterday, about a, uh, he, he, was also, he was in my class out at Quantico, and he wrote it about a Marine second lieutenant in Vietnam, and the guy with all the questions about right or wrong, good or bad, and coming back as a, a Vietnam veteran against the war, uh, do you protest, uh, do you hold true? Those questions all came to me too. You know, was what I was doing a, uh, an immoral enterprise? You know, those questions ring with me today. Um, I still feel that if we had kept our course there, uh, certainly militarily, we won every major engagement that we were ever in. Uh, militarily, we just, we really kicked the butts, uh, you know, of, of our enemy. But politically, we certainly didn't. Um, I think we could have a North Vietnam and a South Vietnam much like we have a, a North Korea and South Korea today. Um, but we did not have the will or the stamina to do that, nor do I think that we had the vision to do that. And certainly we had a very corrupt government in South Vietnam which stood in the way of that, as well as people back here who, uh, you know, who got to the point where it became impossible for us to win that war, even though their leaders, uh, General Jap and others, later on said that uh, they were within days of capitulating if we had sta stayed with it. Uh, lesson we must learn from that, and uh, I was out uh, in Washington, D.C. at the amphitheater uh, in uh, Arlington Cemetery when Caspar Weinberger spoke and, and there were I suppose a couple of thousand troops in there at the time because we were out there for the dedication of the, war, of the uh, Vietnam Wall. Um, and he said, never again must this country uh, engage in a war that it doesn't intend to win. I'm paraphrasing, but, and uh, that place went crazy because all the guys knew that we have been sold short. Uh, and it's, it's, that's, that's painful to think about that. Uh, when I have seven guys that were uh, close to me in a relationship you don't have outside of combat, when their names are on that wall, you have to question this country's resolve. Uh, and to try to never make the mistake again of, of being involved in something that you don't intend to follow through with. Getting a little preachy there, I guess. Um, with those seven men, what was it like losing them in Vietnam or that kind of emotion? Well, the first three, like I say, now this was after I was gone. A couple of them happened just two or three days after I left. One of them was my uh, platoon radio man, a kid named Tommy Smith, who was just a, a terrific Marine. Uh, matter of fact, anybody that stayed in the bush any time at all, um, they were brave. And, and pretty selfless people. You know, they had bought into the brotherhood. Uh, anybody that couldn't hack it, they were gone within two or three weeks or two or three days, you know. Um, and we didn't want them there, you know. If you weren't going to protect your brother, and if you were so 
if you, everybody was scared, but if you couldn't control your fear and manage your fear, then uh, you were a liability to the outfit. And, uh, but when Smitty was killed, he was the first one whose body I identified. He was like a little brother to me. If you can imagine, when, you know, week upon week, he was my radio man, so we were never more, rarely ever more than a couple of arm lengths apart. Uh, when we built a hooch out of our, our ponchos, we were hooch mates. Uh, we ate together. Um, we, you know, traveled right next to each other. We got shot at together. We took care of each other. Um, I feel certain that he saved my life once or twice. Um, and I was there to protect him too, you know. And when I saw him at Gray's registration lying on a table, it just, you know, to this day, I, you know, it, it bothers me, not like it did then. And then there were a string of those guys, you know, and I had to identify the body of two or three of them, and uh, it was always a hard job and uh, something you never forget because they were a different kind of family, but they were family. Um, the experiences you go through in a war situation when you're actually in combat, the way you rely upon one another, the crazy humor that you have, you know, the, the black humor and, and, the, uh, and the way that we released a lot of that tension, you know, was, was sometimes just absolutely nutty. It goes beyond what the boys at the frat house do, you know. It, it was, uh, you just build such a, a common bond that nothing else in life will ever be quite like it. There's nobody that I love more than my wife and my children and my grandchildren and my brothers and sisters and, and uh, my other relatives and, and the friends I have in my church. Uh, but once again, there's this, this piece over here that nobody else can ever touch in terms of how I feel about those people. provide me an example I mean you have to go ID these bodies can you take me into that moment um... <sighs> mm, yeah uh, of course I was coming from the bush and and I came back there when you came back to the route of Da Nang um, it, was, it was pretty safe back there you know you didn't have to worry about getting shot at and that, that was that was strange because you still have your guard up and I went to where Gray's registration is, and, and those guys there, and they're just Marines that, that got stuck with this job. And they have a lot of different bodies, and you can imagine some of them are, are badly torn up. These guys were very respectful. They understood my grief. <clears throat> um, but... Uh, I was fortunate in that I had uh, one of my friends that I went through uh, the training in Quantico with was with the JAG office. He was uh, a lawyer with the Judge Advocate General Office there in Da Nang. And uh, of course I saw my buddy there and, and uh, like I say, those guys were very respectful and, and they knew the right things to say. They could tell I was grieving. Uh, they made sure I was okay to leave I went back to where my buddy was. He he knew that I had been coming back to the rear. And uh, he and his friends got together and, yeah, we drank a little beer and, and uh, talked it through. And that was a real blessing, you know, because the guys that I would have talked about that with were the guys from my platoon who were no longer, uh, you know, I was no longer a part of that unit. They were out there in the bush, and I was not allowed to go back and and uh, and be with them. So I'm glad I had my friend there to help me process it, and uh, and his friends, you know. So uh, that was positive. But you know, I came back, and uh, I can remember grieving back home. I mean, for years, uh, I wrote a poem about Smitty. Uh, got in touch with his family. Um, that was hard to do. Twenty years later, I finally found. His family wrote them a letter, and that was tough for them. They had to process a lot. I know his uh, Smitty's older brother told me 
first that he hated me uh, for getting in touch with him and bringing all that up. Uh, there were two brothers and one sister, and his mother and father were still alive. Uh, they didn't know about him receiving a medal for his heroism. Uh, he, he did an extraordinary thing when he was killed um, that rated a much higher medal than he was awarded. But uh, in the long run, this family had never had a full opportunity to know what happened with him and to understand what kind of, of warrior he was. And in the long run, it became a very healing experience for them. Uh, you know, and they worked through a lot of grief. Of course, some of their grief they had worked for, through before and this dredged up a lot of things, but uh, a lot of formerly unanswered questions were resolved. Uh, I don't know if I've yeah, no. answered your question or not. Yeah. Um, what was the thing that Smitty did um, before he did, died to earn the medal? Our uh, company went in, we had a, a battalion has different companies within it and uh, Bravo Company, my, my company was Charlie Company, C Company. Bravo Company was pinned down at a river called the Lili, Song Lili River. And there was a, a uh, on one side of the river, the NVA were embedded in there and uh, had bunkers and, and uh, had laid down heavy fire on, on Bravo Company. Bravo took several casualties so Charlie Company went in to relieve them. Well, we started getting chopped apart too. Now there was a place where they could cross. It was like river, little island, river, you know. And I'm not talking about the Mississippi River. I'm talking, you know, the, the Embra out here, okay? Uh, maybe a little bigger. Um, the guys would get to that island and, and the snipers had it pinned in so well that uh, we lost 15 guys that night and people go out and try to retrieve them, they get killed. The only way to get extricated was to have either artillery or something else come in and relieve the pressure. So the fire was so intense. Well, what you do in that situation, they called in uh, the fast movers, jets, who would come through with rockets, uh, napalm bombs, that kind of thing to dislodge the enemy, or at least to get them to get their heads down. Um, problem with that was you have to use what we call a smoke grenade that would mark your, the area for the jets to know where to shoot, where not to shoot, okay? So you don't blow out your friendly forces and you, and you actually hit the enemy. The fire was so intense that it seemed impossible for anybody to be able to take that smoke grenade and go out there. I have a copy, I think, with me of the Bronze Star citation he got. Smitty told the company commander, I, I will do this, I can do this. He took off his radio, took off his pack, grabbed the smoke grenades, ran out, fully exposed himself, threw the grenade, successfully marking the territory, and took the bullet through the chest. And uh, he, he died on the helicopter on the way in. And I was back at the battalion rear and listening to all this on the radio and just uh, had a real hard time with that because I felt like I should have been out there with those guys. I had requested to stay with the platoon, but uh, the orders from headquarters said, no, he's, he's going back to a new job. Um, so, yeah, I, that, that was real, real hard for me. But Smitty was truly a hero. The Jets came in. The situation got a lot better, and our guys got extricated then. So, and uh, once again, that's, I don't think he was taken care of properly there. I think that deserved the Silver Star or Navy Cross. You know, that was not only a heroic act on his part and a selfless heroic act, it was also a very successful uh, endeavor. You know, he accomplished the mission that nobody else was going to do. Okay. Um, so looking back on Smitty's death and kind of your experience, particularly in that moment hearing it over the radio, um, 
with 40 plus years gone by, what does that mean to you now? How is it? How do you feel looking back on it? I, uh, oh, I've adjusted well to that. Uh, there, you know, you're not going to change it. Um, once again, you have to have faith that, you know, that, you know, God has the answers. I might know him someday and I might not. I feel that, you know, Smitty's taken care of. It's so unfortunate that his family had to have the grief that they had. Um, his sister did a magnificent thing for all of my Marines. In 19, I think 91, once she found out, you know, once I had contacted her uh, and she found out all of this, she started putting together a reunion for my Marines. I didn't know where any of these guys were. And she worked hard and she and her husband and her family uh, went to a lot of expense, endless hours of, of their time and their money to bring us together as a platoon. And since then we have met at different times, different places. One year we went, met out at Washington, D.C. and all visited the, uh, the wall together, went to the Vietnam Memorial together. And uh, without her effort um, and her compassion, that would never have happened. And I can't tell you how healing that experience was for all of us. Not only that, but to be able to get together in civilian life after all those years and feel that bond was still there. You know, it's a wonderful thing that she did. Okay. Um, so in particular, into the... Uh your guys' reunion in D.C. Um, can you talk a little bit about what that was like having your entire, well, majority of your company with you being there at the Vietnam Wall? <laughs> uh, we had, we must have had 20 guys, maybe maybe two dozen, I don't know. A lot of us were able to be there, um, including uh, one of the platoon commanders that came after I was gone that, that my guys had a lot of respect for. Um, we met there in the mall, and it was uh, a nice summer day, uh, and we got together, had our own little memorial, and then started to march up to the wall together, and one of the security people says, oh, you can't walk across that grass. They had a little rope there, you know, and I thought, if we can't, who the hell can, you know? It was so petty. We weren't disturbing anything. Uh, I understand they have their rules. It's too bad they didn't understand what we were about and the fact that we were just going up there to re pay respects to our buddies whose names were on that wall. It was still, I, the wall was one of the most healing experiences I've ever had in terms of you know, Vietnam and, and what it re represented. Um, when it first came out, of course, that was a very controversial thing. Uh, Maya Lin is the one that designed it. And uh, there was all kinds of controversy. Uh, oh, gee whiz, everybody gets these big, huge, um, uh, heroic monuments, you know. And what did the Vietnam veteran get? A slash in the ground with a big slab of black marble. And uh, you know what? The impact of that is amazing. Now, I don't know if the designers and the builders knew the impact that it would have if they were that um, prophetic, but it certainly does its job. Uh, and, and as far as I'm concerned, as far as most of my guys are concerned, as you walk down into the middle of that, it envelops you. And to see those names up there, uh, <clears throat> to see your own reflection and a reflection of your loved ones in there, uh, I, I don't know. There's something pretty special about it. But the big thing is it was a place to focus our grief and our love. It might, maybe it could be a boulder or a tree and do the same thing. I don't know. But the energy that it had, the, the power of healing that it had, I think was primarily because of the, the grief, the compassion, 
the love and the and the loyalty that that we all felt that we all that that we bring in there and that's not true just for the Vietnam veteran it's true for the Vietnam veterans family you know the wife that said the husband didn't come home the mothers and fathers sisters brothers uncles aunts and cousins uh, the people who lost people dear to them when they come into that place they're coming in you know with a heavy heart and uh, wanting some kind of absolution and I think that that internal spiritual energy is maybe what what brings about such a, a cathartic experience for the people who who are there can you speak a little bit about um, what that experience was like what that the fact that you had a college degree going into the Marines what, what that allowed you to do well first of all let me tell you I was amazed that I graduated from college uh, <laughs> In high school, yeah, I mean, I, I was the first member of my family to graduate from, from college, you know. Uh, wasn't really on the ticket. I'd love to have farmed, you know. Um, but uh, going to college was just a smorgasbord of delights for me. Uh, it's too bad that it got interrupted so often with classes. Uh, some of the classes I liked, but like I say, I uh, I did a lot of, a lot of co-curricular things. And uh, a campus like that, a smaller campus, uh, it's kind of like a small high school I went to. If you wanted to be involved in a play, hey, you can, you can be in a play. If you want to be in a musical group, it's there. If you want to play intramural sports, you know, uh, there's a wealth of that. Uh, leadership activities you can be involved in. Um, and so that was a real time of development for me. And you know, it's interesting that those experiences helped me be a better platoon commander. And that, you know, that thread went on through because I, I had a wide range of experiences. I think it's unfortunate when kids get to the university and just are maybe because of the program or where they are, they're so focused in one area that they don't get out here and test the waters in other areas uh, because at least for me and my experience, uh, having experienced those other uh, areas allowed me to understand my men a lot better because, hey, we had Native Americans in my platoon, Samoan, Hawaiian, Chicago black guys, um, Southern black guys, Southern white guys, uh, New Jersey guys, farm boys like me, um, it was a wide and rich range of people, you know, and their experiences are all different. The thing we had in common was that we were combat Marines, but the, my, my college experience helped me to have a lot better handle on how to deal with each individually. That ironically led to my career later on. I found out that, uh, did I really enjoy listening to these guys? talking to these guys. I was the old guy. I was like 23 years old, you know. They were 18, 19, and 20 for the most part. They had a couple of old guys, 21, 22, you know. Uh, and they didn't have much direction in their lives. Several of them never graduated from high school. And so I would talk to them about, what are we going to do after we're done with this, you know? You, you've got an incredible foundation now. I mean, you're going to have experiences Nobody else ever had. It can cripple you or it can strengthen you. You know, and we talk about those things. And uh, that led me to understand that, well, maybe I could take that into life and, and, and do something with it that was as satisfying to me as being a platoon commander. So when I came back to the States, I uh, went to graduate school and uh, got a couple of degrees, uh, graduate degrees in counseling, and I spent my my uh, civilian career as, as a school counselor, uh, and certainly no regrets there. Okay. Um, in college, were there a lot of like protesting against the war? Um, it seems like it was somewhat eminent at that point. Yeah, there was. A lot of protests against the war when I was in college, and I have a problem with some of them. I don't have a problem with some of them. Uh, I had friends that were very sincere, sincere uh, about their, their angst and, and their, uh, 
de de they detested the war and, and they thought it was wrong. And they, in good conscience, you know, fought tooth and nail against it, protested it. And you know what? I respect those people to this day. But what I saw a lot of, too, were people that jumped on the bandwagon looking for a good time. I can remember one time they decided to go down the streets of Charleston, and the people leading it, I think, had good intentions. Next thing you know, they're busting store windows, opening up uh, water hydrants, and acting like total fools, destroying public and private property. Those people I have no respect for. And their hearts nor their heads were in the right place. They were looking for some kind of silly party. And, they, and, and to hear them talk, they were just as heroic as the people who, who were truly focused on trying to do the right thing. I will always have a problem with people like that. You know, the people that jump on a bandwagon and uh, just are there for the excitement or the thrill of it. I, I don't know. I don't understand people like that. I don't know how you can be like that. But I have friends, two friends I always think of when this question comes up too. Two friends from that era who went to Canada. One of them just couldn't stand it any longer, was going to get drafted, did not want to go to prison, and it tortured him because he loved this country. He finally made the decision to go to Canada. I have no problem with him. I never have, never will. Then I had another friend who was on the other end of the spectrum. He didn't care about anything or anybody but himself. And he wasn't there to make a statement. All, all he ever wanted to do was take care of himself. And I, you know, I, I consider those two different people, two different motives. Uh, have respect for one. I have no respect for the other. But, you know, but yeah, we saw, you know, I mean, the protest grew and grew and grew. And like I say, I have no problem with people who had those, those core moral choices to make. But I have a lot of problem with people who just want to do what was popular. Could you take me into that moment where there was the somewhat rioting on, in Charleston? Um, you know, did you ever expect anything like that to happen while you were in school? Well... No. In, in 1964, I sure as hell didn't. <laughs> but by 1968, you know, things were getting goofier all the time, you know. Well, in 1964, if there was any marijuana on campus, I would be surprised. And there may have been, but nobody knew about it. By 1968, people were, you know, openly uh, uh, smoking marijuana and, you know, doing other drugs. Uh, th there was so much change in that time. Matter of fact, from 68 to 71, when I came back to school, um, there was another sea change in the way in uh, the liberal attitudes toward, toward drugs and sex and, you know, the whole, the whole thing. The, the whole moral code had changed immensely in that, in that amount of time. Um, but as far as watching the destruction, I was never, yeah, you know, I saw that happen. I was gone, you know. I... I know this, my dad, as a, as a kid, if he, he found out I ever vandalized anything, there would have been hell to pay. And I was the same way with my kids. You know, you don't destroy other people's property. You don't destroy public property to make a statement. That's stupid. You know, that doesn't do anything for anybody. Uh, you know, have the courage to stand up, become articulate, state your case, and stand by it. Uh, and what I saw those knuckleheads doing or what I heard they were doing because, like I say, uh, I, I, I stayed away from that for the most part. It's, it's not, uh, not my cup of tea. <laughs> okay. um, so I know that you brought it up a little bit, just a little bit ago about the draft. Um, obviously, you didn't have a whole lot of interaction with the draft because you enlisted. But um, could you talk, to, talk about how, what your views are, were on on the draft when you were leading your men in your company? Yeah, because that was certainly an issue with a lot of my guys. Uh, the draft was an issue with my fellows because several of them have been drafted. Now, back in the day, you know, the Marine Corps takes only volunteers. Well, here's what I found out from some of them. 
they got their draft notice. They went to take their physical. They passed the physical. They get ready for the induction. And the sergeant comes through and says, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, Marine. One, two, three, four. And all of a sudden, they were drafted into the Marine Corps. Um, that was quite a shock to, to several of them. Uh, I had a couple of kids set there by the judge. Uh, you know, they, they'd screwed up. I had nothing major, you know, uh, maybe a drug violation. Maybe they hadn't been in trouble for a couple of other uh, minor crimes, uh, but they were bordering on felonies or were felonies. Judges said Marine Corps or jail. Yeah, they chose Marine Corps and ended up in the bush and wonder if they made the right decision, you know. Uh, but, yeah, the draft, you know, it touched a lot of people. Uh, and, um, you know, I, right or wrong, you know, it's war is wrong, you know. It's, it's a real breakdown in leadership. Um, uh, it's a breakdown in faith between people. Um, but it's there. It's a reality. And uh, if things get bad enough and intense enough, of course, governments can script people and, and put them into the war. Uh, and it, it's a horrible thing, you know. None of those guys really wanted to be there. You know, I didn't really want to be in the bush. Of course, there's that, as you, if you're a young man, sometimes there's that, that excitement about, gee, you wonder what it's like. Uh, you want to test yourself. Can I stand up uh, to the fear of combat? Uh, will I be active? Will I run and hide, you know? Um, you know, and I think that's maybe an unfortunate part of who we are as people, you know, that we think we have to be tested in that way to determine whether or not uh, we are brave or courageous because there are so many ways to be brave or courageous. But, uh, yeah, the draft was a, was a big issue for, for the guys that got drafted. <laughs> okay. Um, so one of the things that I'm personally wondering about, and we spoke about this on Saturday a little bit, was um, your time in the, in the, in the bush. Mm -hmm. describe it can you speak a little bit about um you know what an average day and night is in the bush yeah uh well yeah when i first got into the bush uh we were on a hill 953 one of the in the quason mountains and just knocked over a, a major base camp uh so there was there was a lot of action up there um it was cold and rainy and you're at a pretty high elevation. And, you know, of course, I always heard, you know, going through training and everything, they talk about how hot it was and, and uh, how miserably hot it was. And for the first few weeks, first couple of weeks, I just about froze my butt off. You know, you were always wet. Uh, you laid on the ground. Uh, you didn't have a cot. You didn't have any kind of protection at all. You might have a plastic sheet you laid down, but that didn't help much. Uh, you pulled your poncho liner up over your head and and tried to sleep. Uh, sometimes you put together a uh, kind of a tent. You, you, you got with a buddy, and like for me, it was my radio man, uh, and you snap the ponchos together, get some sticks, and, and make kind of a, a tent to keep the, the rain, the driving rain off of you anyway. Or a lot of times it was just, you know, a constant mist or, or uh, sprinkle. And you didn't stay dry but at least it wasn't beaten down on you then. Um, the nights were scary um, because the VC and MVA always knew where we were. I can't remember any place or any time that the enemy wasn't aware of basically where the, the unit movements were. Uh, and I'm talking about week, weeks and months, uh, whether it was in the mountains or down in the valleys, uh, they always knew where we were. Nights were scary because that's when they would probe your lines. Uh, and, of course, there were all the true stories and horror stories and legends about them coming up and slitting your throat while you're right there in your, in your sleeping hole. Uh, may have had some fact behind it, but, but they were very good at infiltrating our lines. Um, so nights were, were long and scary. Um, the days, you know, when that sun broke and, and you broke out your morning cigarette and coffee, uh, that, was, that was a nice time. 
especially if the sun was shining. And later on in that year, it shined about every day uh, and was hot and miserable uh, down in the valleys. But uh, with the light came a sense of, you know, security. Uh, you could see out there and you could tell, you know, if there was anything coming at you. The exception to that was when you were on the move. We, we uh, were on patrols all the time, platoon patrols. And that's when you, you could almost feel the enemy watching you at times. And it's just like you had a big target painted on you. Uh, one thing I worried about was, was my face, my head. Um, you know, I, I, did, I worried about that more than about being shot in the chest or the back, which would have been a lot more likely. Um, but, but you couldn't let those fears control you. You had to go on. You stay busy. You stay focused on what you're supposed to be doing, and you're okay. You function. Um, and that's what everybody had to do. Were the Marines scared? Yeah, we were scared, scared a lot. Uh, but it never kept us from functioning. The guys that it would keep from functioning, you got rid of. You know, you, they went back to the rear. I very much envisioned the MVA and the Viet Cong as the enemy. They were the enemy. Um, they were shooting at us. They were setting booby traps, uh, you know, and, and they were out to kill us. You know, very definitely. I mean, it, it, that's pretty much black and white for me. Okay. Um, so, I mean, this is a little, I'm a little nervous to ask this. Um, hey, don't, don't be afraid to ask. All right. You're obviously a very moral man. You've thought greatly about this war um, and your time in it. Could you just take me into your mind what, what it would happen if you had grown up in Vietnam and had been a member of the NVA or something like that? Could you take me into their shoes? Little bit or? I suppose uh, what you had is that the people in the country were like me and my country down there. Just leave me the heck alone, you know. The the VC come through and they want me to do it their way. The Americans come through and want me to do it their way. Just leave me alone. Let me tend to my rice paddy and to my oxen, my chickens and ducks and get out of my life, leave my family and me alone. Well, nobody would leave them alone. Um, of course, part of why we were there supposedly was uh, the domino theory of the communists coming through and nation after nation being overtaken by communism. Um, a lot of the seed coming from communist China. Was that a real thing, a real threat? Well, yeah, you know. Um, I think people have played with that enough that they, they don't see that as a real threat, but certainly I, I think it was, at least to some extent. Um, if I were to grow up in Vietnam, how would I feel about things? Well, like I say, if I was to grow up in a rural area in South Vietnam, I'd, I want to be left alone. If I grew up in an urban area, I would probably very be very discouraged uh, with the lack of character in, in my government officials. I would be excited about the possibility that I would see in the capitalist endeavors or the westernization of certain amenities that I would have. Uh, that would be very attractive to me as a young person, I would think. Uh, but politically, if, if I believed in what the communists were doing, uh, to unite the country under communist rule and uh, Ho Chi Minh being the big guy, then if I felt strongly about it, I would fight for it. If I grew up in North Vietnam, I wouldn't have had any choice. If I was a certain age and they wanted me to fight for communism in the South, that's exactly what would happen. There would be no choice. Does that answer your question? Yeah, or? that's great. Yeah. All right. Could you speak a little bit about what it was like to encounter death in the in the in the jungle, and um, when you guys were in Vietnam, um, in terms of killing. Talk about what? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, when you were in Vietnam, mm -hmm. um, what was your first encounter with death there? I know that you said earlier that you hadn't lost any of your men in Vietnam, but. Um, 
first encounter was death, I suppose, was seeing the bodies of the enemy that were killed. Um, very sad. Uh, you read the story about Tennessee. I remember a body being there that day. I mean, I can see it now. You know, I, I can see a lot of the bodies that I saw over there. Um, and matter of fact, before I ever got to the bush, my first helicopter ride out to our battalion headquarters, which was at L.C. Ross, the helicopter I got on, they had just pulled off several body bags. I didn't see those bodies, but I knew what was in there. I got on the helicopter, and there was blood on the helicopter floor. Um, very sobering, you know. And you know right then, hey, this is going to be a long year. Um, but when I saw the body of, uh, of an enemy soldier, it, it was not a pleasant thing to see. Um, I also, sometimes on patrol, we'd come across bodies, not our, not our guys, but the other guys, um, that were badly decomposed um, and maybe infested with flies, uh, maybe entrails hanging out. Never a pleasant thing to see. You know, that was a human being. And based upon who I am and the way I was raised, uh, I had compassion for that. You know, it was not an easy thing to see. I didn't hate those people. I thought it was unfortunate that they were in the same situation that we were. And probably they had it a lot worse than we did. Uh, we knew we might go hungry for a couple of days, but we weren't going to go hungry for a week. Uh, we knew that if we got in a firefight, that our firepower was going to be far superior to theirs. Um, death to anyone with a conscience has an impact. And I don't care if it was them or us. Uh, it was not pleasant. On the other hand, you know, in a body like that of, of Marines that were in combat, you didn't show any great emotion with that. You know, that was an internal thing. Um, you didn't discuss it about, oh, gee, see that poor guy back there? I wonder what his family was like. Uh, I wonder what his life was like. I wonder what's going to happen now back home. You know, you, you didn't discuss that kind of thing. If you did, that was all internal. Um, what kind uh, of effect do you think that had on you when you returned from the war, um, and even till today? Well, I hate to sound cavalier, but uh, I, I've pretty well put that behind me. I'm, I'm okay with that. Uh, I'm not okay that those people died, don't get me wrong. I'm not okay that there was a stupid war uh, caused by people that don't know how to lead other people that are, uh, that are jealous and, and envious and covetous. Um, but in terms of, of carrying a load around with me, I, I don't. You know, uh, My life is today. Uh, I have people that depend on me to be uh, the, the person that, that I choose to be. Um, d I have pretty well the deep grieving that I have for the people that I lost. You know, I, I've worked through that. Um, and uh, I don't feel like uh, it imposes upon me very much at all anymore. How did you, um, how have you moved on from that? How did you put it behind you? Well, for one thing, like I say, through my faith, um, and also the fact that I moved forward. There, I didn't want to spend, I don't want to spend my life living in regrets or living with guilt or living with what ifs. You know, I want my life to mean something. So therefore, I became engaged in, once again, a career and a family, um, serving the community. Um, things that are worthwhile and, and, and notable, um, and noble to, to some extent. I want to, to have a sense of nobility about my life. It's not always that way, but, but life has meaning and purpose to me. That is nothing but an anchor. I threw that overboard a long time ago. Okay. Um, you're obviously a very Christian man. We've gotten... We know that. Um, how do you think 
you know, coming from a, a Christian household growing up and everything like that, how did you reconcile the war um, based on your faith? Um, there was, it seems there's a contrast between war and faith and Christianity. Could you speak to that a little bit and how you felt about that contrast? There certainly is a contrast between, you know, what Christ taught and what is practiced on this old earth. Uh, for one thing, I'm not Christ. I would like to be Christ-like, wish I were more that way. Uh, and anybody who believes in the gospel should be moving toward that as well as they can in this life. Um, there are aspects of the real world, you know, the physical world, that sometimes we're not in charge of. Um, there's a thing that's been around, and I, I'm sure you've heard that, that there are three basic types of people in the world. There are sheep, there are wolves, and there are sheep dogs. Uh, I think it's okay, uh, you know, the, the sheep, of course, is the common person who goes about their life pretty well unaware of either threats around them or whatever, or maybe powerless or careless in, in terms of uh, avoiding that, that peril. There are the wolves who are there to attack other people. Then there are the sheepdogs who are there to protect the sheep against the wolves. I don't have much conflict in, as a Christian in feeling that sometimes in my life I have played the role of the sheepdog. Um, I don't know that we'd consider Christ a sheepdog. He was far beyond that. Um, but I think at some point in time, people have to make a choice. Which one of those three am I? And you know, I've made my choice. I don't know if that answers your question or not, but that's, that's the way I feel about it. Yes, uh, can I be a Christian and still be a warrior if I need to be? I think the circumstances determine that, you know. Am I going to stand around if I can keep some, some child from being brutalized by somebody? Am I going to stand by and watch it? No, I'm not. Nor would Christ. Um, but, you know, those are choices we make. And, and taking it to the to fullest extent, you know, is war, is there a good war? Well, you know, that's been open to debate for centuries. Is there a time when... Nations have to defend themselves? Well, obviously, yes. Um, was Vietnam one of those times? No, we weren't defending ourselves. Uh, in Korea, did, were we defending ourselves? Not really. But that turned out pretty well for the South Koreans. That's a complicated question, you know? Um, but I am glad that we have a military that often has the kind of leaders that have a strong moral center. I have a nephew who is a major in the Army. He served in Kosovo, Iraq, Afghanistan a couple of times. Last time he was there, he got blown up pretty bad. He's in Saudi Arabia right now. You will never meet a more moral man. Uh, he has his opinions about the war, good, bad, indifferent. But one thing he can do, and he was like me, one thing he can do is make sure that he and the men under him make the most moral choices they can. Some things are out of our control. You know, if you're a second or a first lieutenant or a captain in the Marine Corps, there are a lot of things you cannot control. But there are things in the small unit uh, arena you definitely can control. Did you ever lose hope through it all? Hope of what? Hope of seeing the other side, maybe um, seeing your purpose there. You know what? That, that, that is a good question. Did I ever use, lose hope or, or um, in what our mission was? you know, to win the war. I'll put it this way. Your focus, when you're in the situation that I was in Vietnam, if you're a ground pounder in a small unit, 
your mission is to, first of all, follow orders, do your patrolling, do your job, and the, then it becomes all about keeping one another alive, taking care of the man next to you. That becomes your, your probably your primary focus. What do we do to stay alive today while we go about our job? How do I protect him? How does he protect me? And how do we, how do, we do that as a unit? And that stuff about hope, your hope over there was survive today. Then survive tomorrow, one day at a time until that magic day comes when you rotate back home. That's what that was like. That's, that's your biggest hope. And then I guess, somewhat summing up, um, if you could go back to Vietnam in your time in the war, would you change anything that you did or anything that your pollu or your company did? I don't know what it would be, no. Um, and I'm very thankful that I was raised the way I was because I think I made some good choices that I saw other people not make. So, uh, really not that many regrets, no. Uh -uh. Okay. Um, and then I know I meant to touch on this a little bit earlier, and I know you referenced him, but could you tell us a little bit about Tennessee? Tennessee was a good old boy from Tennessee. Uh, tall, tall kid, uh, had that great southern accent, uh, Strong, quiet, you know, kind of a, a quiet guy, a gentle guy, tough and strong, but gentle, uh, a man of faith. When he was, I, I can remember this, what, and, and this says a lot about his personality. He had been laying there for a couple hours with a bullet wound through his chest, sucking chest wound, you know, and, and there wasn't much hope of him surviving, you know, I mean, we kept telling him everything's okay, but we knew darn good and well it wasn't. And one of the guys came over and said, said to him, Tennessee, he said, we're, we're going to get him. We'll find him and we're going to get him. And Tennessee's reaction was, you know, he doesn't want to be here any more than we are. You know, in other words, forget that, you know. Uh, wasn't looking for revenge, just wanting to hang on to life. You know, and I, I think that was a, a good testimonial as to the, the core and the center of who that man was. He's, he's a very good man, very good man. Could you tell me a little bit about um, what happened in Tennessee after the war? You know, I, I hadn't, didn't have any contact with him for decades. And then uh, you read the short story that I had published in Military Magazine. Somehow that got to him. Uh, and at that point in time, then we were able to establish contact. And uh, I know that he ended up uh, with a, a very nice family. His wife is, is wonderful. We got to meet her just a little over, about a year and a half ago at our farm uh, when he came up for a reunion. Um, and I know that, uh, you know, you, you don't go through that experience without, without some suffering. And uh, I, th I think that uh, Tennessee had a lot to process and a lot of healing to do, probably uh, emotionally and, and psychologically as well as, as physically. But once again, he was a man of faith and you know that kind of strength uh, is your anchor uh, as, as far as truly uh, healing, you know. And then he understood too the love and support of the of the, the men that served with him, uh, and their their opinion of him was very high, and uh, I think that helped him get through that crisis as well. We're gonna, I want to throw out one more question. My my brother is in the military. He was in Afghanistan. He was in Iraq. He was in the Pentagon when it was hit. Oh, excuse yeah. Me. So, um, and this is a question. This is something he and I have discussed. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you again reconcile 
the impact on the civilian population of, of the war. I mean, not that it's not that you guys, you know, I'm not pointing the finger at you guys or yeah. finger at anybody else, but have you, you've, you're obviously a thoughtful man and you've thought through this a lot. How does, I don't know, how does that, how, how have you thought through that or if someone says civilians in war, what, what is it, what do you think of? When the innocents, talk, talk to him. <laughs> the, probably the most difficult part of assessing war is what it does to the innocents, to the non-combatants, to the civilians, to the women, children, and innocent men who just don't want anything to do with it. Unfortunately, there are bullies in the world, and sometimes those bullies are governments, sometimes they're terrorists. Uh, sometimes they're street gangs, but there are bullies out there, and and the worst thing about bullies is they pick on innocent people. Uh, we saw, of course, in, in South Vietnam, uh, those people were, were decimated. Uh, the people out in what I call the free fire zones earlier on, they didn't have any choice but to leave their homes, either that or be at the mercy of whoever came through uh, and, and be brutalized by those people. Um, I think that happened more with the people we fought than it did with our own troops, but it still happened. Uh, the, the most horrible thing about war is um, what it does to the innocents of this world. Um, once again, that's why you need moral leaders, not leaders that worry about their own personal careers, uh, not leaders who are out to covet and gain things that, that don't belong to them, but leaders with true strong moral cores who care about that common person out there. Um, the sacrificial type of sheepdog who is willing to give of themselves to make sure that people are protected. Uh, that's the most horrendous part of war, I think, is the, the what it does to, to innocent people, to people who just simply want to live their lives. Incidentally, uh, it's interesting to see what happened to South Vietnam's population once we pulled out. Uh, people put in concentration camps, people that were uh, assassinated, uh, you know, it, it was brutal, absolutely brutal. But the continuation of the war itself would have been brutal as well. I don't know that any more people died due to the communists coming in and purging uh, than would have happened if, we, if that war continued for another five or ten years. Uh, but the, the bottom line is innocent people shouldn't have to suffer because of bullies.